So let's go ahead and start looking at our second lecture in the biotechnology uh, series here. And what we're looking at is with biotechnology, again, just all of the connections to the different aspects of our lives, food, agriculture, energy, healthcare, etc., and how all of this is tied together into this field of biotechnology. Last lecture, we left off with this idea or this uh, term called transformation. This is the in introduction of DNA into a different cell. Sometimes it's intentional where scientists are injecting it. Other times it's actually unintentional in the case of bacteria that actually pick up DNA from the environment and then incorporate it into their cell. So it makes it kind of interesting if there's something dead and the DNA is on the ground, bacteria potentially can pick up those genes and blend them into their own genetic code. So it makes it really a fascinating uh, scenario when we start looking at how species change and we'll get into that more with evolution. But with the DNA, what we're looking at with this technology is <clears throat> how we can manipulate genetics and change things. Do we inject it into a zygote? Do we inject embryonic stem cells into the embryo? All the different possibilities that are in front of us right now are just amazing. Um, so we talked about gel electrophoresis, very important technique used to separate and sort DNA based on size and charge. Another technique that's important to have a basic understanding of is this thing called PCR cycling. This is when we will actually amplify DNA in vitro or copy it and make copy after copy after copy after copy of a DNA strand to then either use a DNA for research, maybe we're injecting it into lots and lots of individuals, maybe we're trying to test that piece of DNA for a specific gene. But PCR cycling is an incredibly important and very useful tool that enables us to make uncountable numbers of copies of DNA. So it's doing the exact same thing that our cell does during the S phase of the cell cycle. But we're just doing this in a test tube, in a controlled environment. You have to have a primer, that tell, well, let me back up. You have to have an enzyme to rip open the strand, break it apart, primers that dictate where it starts. You have to have all of the appropriate nucleotides within that environment. So you have to have adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine in the environment. You have to have the enzyme, the uh, DNA polymerase that will attach those new DNA nucleotides to the existing template strand and then the helicase or the uh, ligases to clean it up and smooth it out and make sure everything goes well but it's amazing how fast and how much DNA can be produced in such a short period of time so 20 cycles of PCR you start with a single fragment and 20 cycles you can have over a million copies of that DNA so think about crime scene investigations. Think about, the, there was a movie that came out a couple years ago called The Judge. Robert Downey Jr., Robert Duvall. Robert Duvall is older gentleman. He's a judge. His son, Robert Downey Jr., is an attorney. And it turns out Duvall is apparently getting senile and slipping with his uh, cognitive abilities. And it's thought that he hit somebody with his car, hit and run. They find DNA evidence on the vehicle, blood on the car. Does that match back up to the blood of the victim? If so, that connects that vehicle with that crime. Does not connect the driver, but it connects the vehicle. So they were using PCR. Let's take a sample from the hood of the car, amplify it so we have a large volume of DNA to work with when we're doing the analysis, and then let's look at the gene sequence. So let's go back to electrophoresis, chop the DNA up, put it into the gel, separate it based on size and charge, and determine, is this the same blood on the car? Is that the victim's DNA on the car? Does that match up to the victim? Okay, now we have genetic, physical proof 
that that vehicle hit that individual. So I said it's just pervasive with how we see DNA and electrophoresis and biotechnology just all over the place, not just in the movies, but in our daily lives. So here was an interesting case back in the early 90s. Now this goes back um, almost 18, 20 years here. This body was found in the Swiss Alps, and that's not a rare thing. Di <clears throat> Hikers, unfortunately, die in the Swiss Alps, altitude sickness, avalanches, etc. But when the body was exhumed and pulled out of the ice, they noticed some interesting things about them. Hmm, look at the tools, look at the weapons on the, the um, autopsy tray or table here. Look at that axe, the knife, these other tools and the pouches and things that were with this individual. That showed us it wasn't anything, anybody modern. Turns out this guy was over 5,000 years old, died over 5,300 years ago. So pretty amazing to find almost a perfectly preserved body that old. So DNA analysis of his intestinal contents. So they went in, took out a sample of food or stuff out of his intestines. And based upon DNA analysis of that food, you could determine what he ate. You could determine, oh, he's got DNA from wheat in his stomach and intestinal tract, DNA from meat, from different animals, wild game, etc., different DNA representing different greens and plants. They actually identified the greens and the vegetables and the plants that he had eaten and determined he died during the springtime because those plants are only available in the spring. So imagine if anybody's a hunter and you find, we call it scat or poop, out on the in the field and you look at it you can figure out all right is this from a raccoon or a deer or a rabbit based on the shape and what's in there but if you did a further analysis you could figure out exactly what they're eating so it's a great tool for conservation for hunters and for people dealing with wildlife management to look at the dna analysis of the contents of the digestive system it tells you what was eaten by that animal and what information we can learn from that. Okay, so again, lots and lots of uses. Um, here's a movie, odds are most people have seen. I would encourage you guys to go back and watch this again and look at all the DNA inside of it. Go back to the original Jurassic Park. Probably get it on Netflix or Hulu or you know, sometimes it's just on regular TV. But look at all of the DNA information and the technologies that they're talking about they're talking here's this virtual reality and we can do this and that and this came out in the early 90s and it seemed so science fiction at that point but that's what we're doing today we're doing jurassic park today we're pulling dna out we're splicing it together no we're not creating dinosaurs because we don't have <clears throat> a viable piece of dna from the dinosaurs at this point but we're doing it with all sorts of other things. We could bring back extinct species if we have their DNA. So the black rhino went extinct several years ago. I think it was in early 2011, 2012, somewhere in that time frame. We could bring back that species if we have their DNA. Problem is, we bring it back. Where is it going to live? And poaching wiped them out in the first place. At this point, we still haven't resolved the poaching issue they would just get poached into extinction a second time. So not a viable scenario at this point, not a viable use of DNA at this point, but something that could easily be used in the future. So when we're looking at DNA analysis, whether it's with Jurassic Park or the stomach contents of the individual or whatever, we want to try to determine the sequence of the nucleotides. That is an incredibly important step in DNA analysis. So the DNA is run through the gel electrophoresis based on the distance and the position that it goes. We can actually determine the pattern of the nucleotides, or as we say, the DNA letters. So in this particular code, the alphabet reads a, T, G, C, T, T, C, G, G, C, A, A, etc. 
you can take that, transcribe it into RNA, translate it into an amino acid, and figure out the code for a particular gene that you want to work with. So knowing the sequence of nucleotides is another important step when we're working with biotechnology. And what we're doing with all this information is creating a genomic library. Literally a library instead of books, it's a library of genes. And understanding these genes do this, these genes do that, here's this piece of DNA, that piece of DNA, and what each piece does. So as we continue to develop this field, if there is the interest and the support from the public, we literally will have a library of genes where people could go and pull genes from the library to create a new organism. Now, it may not be something completely brand new that we've never seen before. You know, usually we start with a host and then we just enhance and add to the host and change maybe one or two little pieces. So our bacterial example here, you know, oh, I want to add this little yellow gene because that's going to produce insulin. I'm going to add this little blue gene because that's going to produce Maybe it's a growth hormone, or maybe it's some other medicine that we need for society. So with the genomic library, we're able to manipulate this and work with this better. Okay? So it also gives us the ability to analyze the differences between each of us individually and then between species. So when we run these sequences and we look at these little differences, they're called SNP differences, single nucleotide polymorphism. Basically, there's one difference here in this stretch of DNA between the individual on the top and the individual on the bottom. And that says, okay, that's your genetic uniqueness as an individual. You and your brother or you and your sister or siblings, you're going to see some of these little, they call them SNPs. These little SNPs because mom and dad gave you slightly different genetic information. That's our individual genetic variation there in those little things we call SNPs. Now the difference we see between species, um, white-tailed deer versus mule deer, uh, white oak tree versus a pin oak, is when you get into gene differences. This chunk is different than this chunk which means there's a different allele. We call it the allelic difference. An entirely different gene, which produces a different trait, which is enough to make that individual, that species, different than the other species. So with these differences, what we're doing is figuring out how to create DNA fingerprints, specific DNA information that is unique to the individual, to you, to the species, a species. So back to our crime scene analysis, here's the individual, here's DNA from the crime scenes, and here's our suspects. Can we match that information back up to the crime scene to say, okay, based upon the DNA fingerprinting, that puts you at the crime scene, or better yet, positive scenario, it makes you free. And it was not you at the crime scene because the DNA evidence does not convict you of that crime. So a lot of good uses. We want to make sure it's used in a positive light and act used accurately.